2. The second part of my sermon is to be occupied by speaking to newly awakened souls, and as I have made four remarks to confirmed Christians, I will now endeavor to answer three questions to those who are newly awakened. The first question they would ask me is this. How am I to know that my desires are proofs of a work of grace in my soul? Some of you may say, I think I can go so far as the text, I have desired God, I know I have desired to be saved. I have desired to have an interest in the blood of Jesus, but how am I to know that it is a desire sent of God, and how can I tell whether it will end in conversion? Hear me, then, while I offer one or two tests. 1. First, you may tell whether your desires are of God by their constancy. Many a man when he hears a stirring sermon, has a very strong desire to be saved, but he goes home and forgets it. He is as a man who seeth his face in a glass, goeth away, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he is. He returns again, once more the arrow sticks hard in the heart of the king's enemy, he goes home, only to extract the arrow, and his goodness is as the morning cloud, and as the early dew it passeth away. Has it been so with you? Have you had such a desire? Will tomorrow's business take it away? Are you wanting Christ today? And will ye despise him tomorrow? Then I am afraid your desires are not of God, they are merely the desires of a naturally awakened conscience, just the stirrings of mere nature, and they will go as far as nature can go, and no farther. But if your desires are constant ones take comfort. How long have they lasted? Have you been desiring Christ this last month or these last three or four months? Have you been seeking him in prayer for a long season? And do you find that you are anxious after Christ on the Monday as well as on the Sunday? Do you desire him in the shop when the intervals of business allow you to do so? Do you seek him in the night, in the solemn loneliness, when no minister's voice breaks on your ear, when no truth is smiting your conscience? Is it but the hectic flush of the consumption that has come upon your cheek, which is not the mark of health? Or is it the real heat of a true desire, which marks a healthy soul? Are you desiring God constantly? I admit there will be variations even to our more sincere desires, but a certain measure of constancy is essential to their real value as evidences of a divine work. 2. Again, you may discern whether they are right or wrong by their efficacy. Some persons desire heaven very earnestly, but they do not desire to leave off drunkenness, they desire to be saved, but they do not desire salvation enough to shut their shops up on Sunday morning, or to bridle their tongues, and leave off speaking ill of their neighbors. They desire salvation, but they do not desire it enough to come sometimes on the weekday to hear the gospel. You may tell the truthfulness of your desires by their efficacy. If your desires lead you into real, works meet for repentance, then they come from God. Wishes, you know, are not unless they are carried out. Many, say unto you, shall seek to enter in, but shall not be able, strive to enter in at the straight gate. Seeking will not do, there must be striving. Our prophet here informs us, that whilst he desired God in the night, that desire was very efficacious. For, in the 18th verse, he declares. In the way of thy judgments, O Lord, we have waited for thee. This desire made me wait for thy judgments. How many do I hear say I am waiting for God, it is all I do, there I lie at the pool of Bethesda, and one of these days an angel will come and stir the pool. Stop! How do you know you are not? Deceiving yourself? There is a friend waiting for me to tea, I will step into the room. There is no kettle on the fire, there is not a bit for me to eat. Sir, we have been waiting for you. But there is nothing ready in the house. I do not believe them, they could not have been waiting for me, or else they would have been ready. And waiting for God always implies being ready. Says a man, I am waiting for God. But he is not ready for God at all, he still keeps on his drunkenness, the house is still unswept, he is as worldly as ever. He is waiting. Yes, but waiting implies being ready, and nobody is waiting that is not ready. You are not waiting for the coach until you have your coat and hat on ready to start, and are looking out at the door for it, and you are not waiting for God, until you are ready to go with God. No man ought to say, I am waiting for God. No, beloved, it is God who is waiting for us generally, rather than any of us waiting for him. No sinner can be beforehand with him. 
But the prophet waited in the way of God's judgments, that is, waited in the right place, waited in the house of God, waited under the sound of the gospel. And then this desire led him to seek. With my spirit within me will I seek thee. It led him to seek after God. Oh! The poor pitiful desires of some of you are very little good. An old writer says, hell is paved with good intentions. I was not aware that there was any pavement at all, because it has no bottom, but at the same time I believe that the sides of the pit are hung round with good intentions, and men will feel themselves pricked and goaded from side to side with good designs that they once formed but never carried out, children that were strangled at the birth, desires that never were brought into living acts, desires that sprang up like the mushroom in the night, and like the fungus were swept away, like smoke from the chimney, that stopped as soon as the fire had gone out. Oh! Brethren, if these are your desires, they are not practical, they do not come of God. But if your desires have made you give up your drunkenness, have compelled you to renounce your theatre-going, have constrained you to seek God with full purpose of heart, have brought you to give up one lust and another, take comfort, you are in the right road, if your desires are practical desires. 3. Again, you can tell these desires by their urgency. Ah! You want to be saved some of you, but it must be this day next week. But when the Holy Ghost speaks, he says, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. It must be now or never. Today give me grace, today give me mercy, today give me pardon. Some of you hope to be saved before you die, before the pit closes on you. You hope Jesus Christ will look down upon you in some years to come. You have not set down how many years, I suppose, but it is always in the distant hazy future. But the true desire is now. Does the poor man who stands upon the scaffold with a rope round his neck say, pardon me in a year's time? No, he is afraid he shall the next minute be launched into eternity. He who feels his danger will cry, now. He who wants Christ really, will cry, now. He who is spiritually awakened will cry out, now or never. What? Sinner, will it do to postpone salvation? Doth thine heart tell thee it will do by and by? What? When the fire is just coming through the boards of thy little chamber? What? When thy ship has struck upon the rock, and is filling? Yes, she is filling, while the fire at the other end is rushing up, and fire and water together are seeking thy destruction. Wilt thou say, tomorrow? Why, thou mayest be dead ere tomorrow's sun has risen. Tomorrow. Where is it? In the devil's calendar, it is not written in any book on earth. Tomorrow. It is some fancied islet in the far off sea that the mariner has never reached. Tomorrow. It is the fool's desire, which he never shall gain. Like a willow the wisp it dances before him, but only lands him in the marshes of distress. Tomorrow. There is no such thing. It is God's. If there is such a day, ours it cannot be. Tillotson well remarks, to be always intending to live a new life, but never to find time to set about it. This is as if a man should put off eating and drinking, and sleeping, from one day and night to another, till he is starved and destroyed. But you say, if I have desired God, why have I not obtained my desire before now? Why has not God granted my request? In the first place, you have hardly a right to ask the question, for God has a right to grant your petition or not as he pleases, and far be it from man to say to God, what doest thou? He is a sovereign, and has power to do what he will. But since thine anxiety has dictated the question, let my anxiety attempt to answer it. Perhaps God has not granted thy desire, because he wishes thine own profit thereby. He designs to show thee more of the desperate wickedness of thine heart, that in future thou mayest fear to trust it. He wants thee to see more of the blackness of darkness and of the horrible pit of sin, that like a burnt child thou mayest shun the fire forever. He lets thee go down into the dungeon, that thou mayest prize liberty the better when it comes. And he is keeping thee waiting, moreover, that thy longings may be quickened. He knows that delay will fan the desire, and that if he keeps you waiting it will not be a loss to you, but will gain you much, because you will see your necessity more clearly, seek him more. Earnestly, cry more bitterly and your heart will be more in earnest after him. Besides, 
poor soul, God keeps thee waiting, perhaps in order that he may display the riches of his grace more fully to thee at the last. I believe that some of us who were kept by God a long while before we found him, loved him better perhaps than we should have done if we had received him directly, and we can preach better to others, we can speak more of his loving kindness and tender mercy. John Bunyan could not have written as he did if he had not been dragged about by the devil for many years. Ah! I love that picture of dear old Christian. I know when I first read that book, and saw the old woodcut in it of Christian carrying the burden on his back, I felt so interested for the poor fellow, that I thought I should jump with joy when, after the poor creature had carried his burden so long, he at last got rid of it. Ah! Beloved, and God may make you and me carry the burden for a long time till he takes it off that we may leap all the higher with joy when we do get deliverance, for depend upon it, there is no poor penitent who loves mercy so well as he who has been ferrying for it for a season. Perhaps that is the reason why God keeps you waiting. One more thought here. Perhaps it has come already. I think some of you are pardoned and you do not know it. I think some of you are forgiven, though you are expecting something wonderful as a sign which you will never receive. Persons have got the strangest notions in the world about conversion. I have heard persons tell the queerest tales you could imagine about how they were converted, though of course I did not believe them. And I fancy some of you think you will have a kind of electric shock, that a sort of galvanism, or something or other, will pass through you, such as you never had before. Do not be expecting any miracles now. If you will not think you are pardoned till you get a vision, you will have to wait many a year. Some people fancy they are not pardoned because they have never heard a voice in their ears. I should be very sorry to have my salvation dependent on a text of scripture applied to my heart, I should be afraid that the devil had applied it, or that it was the wind whistling behind me. I want something more sure than that. But perhaps you are forgiven, and you do not yet know it. God has spoken the tidings of mercy to your spirit, and you have not yet heard it, because you are saying, it cannot be that. If you could but sit down and think of this, this is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief, methinks you would find that after all you are not excluded. There is no great need for any of these miraculous things that you are reckoning upon. God may have given them to some of his people, but he has never promised them. Perhaps, then, the question may be answered by saying, the pardon is there, but you do not know it. Oh! May God speak loudly in your soul, that you may know really and certainly that he has forgiven you. But there is one more serious inquiry, and it is, will God grant my desire at last? Yes, poor soul, verily he will. It is quite impossible that you should have desired God and should be lost, if you have desired him with the desire I have described. For I will suppose that you should go down into the chambers of the lost with the desire still in your spirit. When you entered within the gates you would have to say, I desired mercy of God, and he would not give it me. I sought grace at the hands of Jesus, and he would not give it. You know what would be said at once. Satan would be so pleased. Ah, he would say, here is a sinner that perished praying, God has not kept his promise, he said. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, and here is one that did it, and he is lost. Ah! How they would howl for joy in hell. They would sing a blasphemous song against the Almighty God, that one poor desiring soul should be there. I tell you one thing, I have heard many wicked things in my life, I have heard many men swear and blaspheme God, till I have trembled, but there is one thing I never did hear a man say yet, and I think God would scarcely permit any man to perpetrate such a lie, I never heard even a drunken man say. I sincerely sought God with full purpose of heart, and yet he has not heard me, and will not answer me, but has cast me away. I scarcely think it possible, although I know that men can be infinitely wicked, that any man could utter such an abominable falsehood as that. At any rate, I can say I never heard it, and I believe there are some of you who can say, I have been young and now am old, yet have I never seen one penitent sinner who could say, in despair, I am not saved. I have sought God and he will not hear me, he has cast me away from his face and will not give me mercy, and, I think, as long as you live you will not meet a case. Then why should you be the first? Why, poor penitent, shouldst thou be the first? Dost thou think thou art a chosen mark for all the arrows of the Almighty? Hath he set 
be for a but against which he will direct all the thunderbolts of his vengeance. Art thou to be the first instance in which mercy fails? Art thou to be the one who shall first outdo the infinity of love? Oh! Say not so. Despair is mad, but for one instant gather up thy reason thou despairing one. Would God wish to see thee damned? Hath he not said, As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, but would rather that he should turn to me and live. Do you think it would be a pleasure to the Almighty to have your blood? Oh! Far be it from you to conceive it. Do! You not think that he loves to pardon? Hath he not said himself he delighteth in mercy? And is it not written, As the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts? What advantage would it be to God to destroy your souls? Would it not be more to his honor to save you? Ah, assuredly, because you would sing his praise in heaven, would you not? Yes, but recollect, the best argument I can use with you is this, do you suppose that God would give his son to die for sinners, and yet would not save sinners? It is written in the scriptures, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, and you are a sinner, you feel that you are a sinner, you know it. Then he came to save you? Only believe that. As a poor penitent you have a right to believe it. If you were a Pharisee you would not have that right, but as a penitent, humble, contrite soul, you have a right to believe in Jesus. The Pharisee has. None for it is never written that he came to save the righteous, and if he believed he did he would believe a lie, but every man who is a sinner, every man who lays claim to that title, has a right also to believe that Christ died for him, and not only so but it is the truth. He came into the world for a certain purpose and what he came for he will do. He came into the world to save sinners, and now it is written, Whosoever believeth on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved, he that believeth not shall be damned. When, last Friday, I had the honor of preaching to many thousand persons in the open air, such an assembly as I never dreamed of seeing, and such a vast number as I could scarcely have fancied would have met for any religious purpose, I noticed a most singularly powerful echo, constantly taking up the last words of my sentences and sending them back, as if some great giant voice had spoken to confirm what I had said. When I had repeated the words, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, echo said. Saved, and when I proceeded, he that believeth not shall be damned, I heard the echo gently say, damned. Methinks this morning I hear that echo, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and the saints above cry, saved. Hark! How they sing before the throne. Hark! How your glorified parents and your immortalized relatives, cry, saved. Hear ye not the echo, as it echoes from the blue sky of heavens, saved. And, oh! Doleful thought, when I utter those words, he that believeth not shall be damned, there comes up that dread word, damned, from the place where there are, hollow groans, and sullen moans, and shrieks of tortured ghosts. God grant that you may never know what it is to be damned. God give you to believe now, for, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. 